Good afternoon. Thank you for the very warm response. Uh, feeling like school days when I see quite a number of uh, my colleagues uh, in the audience. I thought I would share uh, with you today, in the next uh, prescribed 20 minutes or so, in very broad terms, uh, the relationship between effective and ethical leadership. Uh, can ethics and being effective be mutually reinforcing rather than be in conflict? Uh, I know that many eminent persons, uh, Alan mentioned uh, them in this lecture series, we have spoken on effective leadership. So I'll be more inclined on the ethics component. The central issue is not one of style. Uh, John Cotter, who taught me at uh, leadership and change at the uh, HBS, in his book, What Leaders Really Do, said that he conducted 14 formal studies and more than a thousand interviews. You often hear people say that we need a new leadership style uh, for this century, uh, if you use a local parlance in the new normal. In a globalizing world with a better educated workforce and constituency that is no longer inclined to be seen and not heard, a new leadership, of course, is called for, but style is not the key leadership issue. Substance is. It is about core behavior on the job, not surface detail and tactics, a core that changes little over time across different cultures or in different industries or societies. And ethics, to me, is an essential core of that substance. So let me begin with uh, broad definitions. Being effective is about being able to influence others, to have an impact. A large component, a large precondition of this is that you must have the power to do so. But having said that, we need to remember what Lord Acton said, that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Being ethical is to recognize virtues which are worthy of honor and recognition by the community. Examples would be integrity, citizenship, service, and moral limits. Uh, Aristotle, during his time, identified courage, justice, prudence, and temperance as virtues of character. There is a certain idealism uh, in being ethical. These are actually habits of the heart. But remember also that the leaders are humans. And so to put the question before us in a raw form, can the exercise of influential power uh, be, be uh, and idealism go together? Can the exercise of influential power and idealism uh, go together? Let me give uh, you four illustrations. The intent of the first two illustrations is to show that the issue before us is not new. The other two illustrations show that the issue is still relevant and not localized. It's, uh, it's an issue that is pervasive and will continue to be relevant. I will not refer to local cases uh, or to the Enron case or to the BP case or to the banking uh, crisis in the U.S. It is rich, rich, uh, these issues uh, before us today, effective leadership, ethical leadership. Uh, they make great case studies for the subject, but I thought you would have read of them, and I thought I should not uh, replicate. Let me first of all uh, start with the first one. And uh, uh, being in school, we are thought to appreciate uh, the poetry and the poems. So let me start with Percy Shelley's, this is 1792 to 1822, uh, to, uh, 1822, which is Percy Shelley's time. And she wrote Ozymandias. I think you're familiar with that. And I'll read that. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless lakes of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stem on those lifeless things, the hand that mocked them 
and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Osimandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. And Percy Shelley says, nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. And I know that as I read that poem, you would be able to relate in your own mind uh, the subject that we are concerned with, effective and ethical leadership. The next illustration is a familiar one, I think familiar to those of us uh, in school, David and Goliath. David defeated Goliath and saved Israel, but later uh, became king. He seduced Bathsheba and deliberately sent her husband to a certain death in battle. Effective, but perhaps unethical. Consider now the embryonic stem cell research. I chair the uh, bioethics uh, committee. I chair the subgroup that dealt with the ethical issue of this particular research, the embryonic stem cell research. The contemporary issues then were with reproductive cloning, therapeutic cloning, and regenerative medicine. The broader national context is this. Singapore wants to be among nations they are in the forefront of biomedical research, but must practice good science. Embedded in this research is the moral status of the developing fetus. One view is that it is a person from the moment of conception, and therefore the research is wrong uh, right from the, from the beginning. But what if it involves the treatment of your own very sick infant child and that the life of the child hangs in the balance with the result of this particular research? Another view is that the research can be for the common good in saving lives, in healing diseases. Conflicting? Can you mutually reinforce the progress of science and the ethics, can you lead the progress of science and be concerned at the same time with the ethics involved in the embryonic stem cell research? Consider another scenario. I'm Singapore's representative to the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights. One issue is whether the exercise of human rights and freedoms, I quote, shall be subject to such limitations as are determined by law for the purpose of securing the recognition and respect for the rights and freedoms of others and of meeting the just requirements of morality, public order, and general welfare. Close quote. An example of the human rights are this. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Very fundamental, very inherent to the discourse on human rights. Everyone has the right to life, to liberty and security of person. All are equal before the law and are entitled without discrimination to equal protection of the law. Now these are examples, and there are many such examples, uh, of serious civil and political rights. In human rights discourse, these are first generation rights. In other words, when uh, human rights discourse first started, uh, this became obvious and natural human rights that should be enshrined in the thoughts of men.